Hey guys, welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. I'm not going to do a long introduction on this one, but I am going to do a disclaimer. I have spent a week researching this case. It has been so crazy interesting to research and look up news articles and all that sort of stuff. But it's a very complex, intense case. And of course, I will have missed out a few details here and there. Whether intentionally or unintentionally, I can't mention everything because this video would literally go on forever. Um, but as always, if you know anything that I haven't mentioned, feel free to put it in the comments down below. But be respectful and be nice and be lovely. This is a nice a nice space on this channel. No space for meanness because I do delete comments because I'm a very sensitive person. <laughs> so on the 8th of June 1989, the body of Cindy James was found in the back garden of an abandoned house in Richmond, British Columbia in Canada, which is just outside of Vancouver. She was found hogtied with her hands and feet behind her back with a nylon stocking around her neck. And the discovery of her body marked the end of six and a half years of terror, stalking and harassment that Cindy had endured. The cause of her death was a drug overdose and strangulation and to everyone it seemed like a pretty clear cut murder. However, the police didn't think it was and they actually believed that the six and a half years of stalking that Cindy endured, she had done to herself. And you are about to go on a roller coaster with this case because it is so, interesting. Over the six and a half years, Cindy had reported over 100 incidents of stalking and harassment to the Canadian police. However, in all of this time and with every single incident being investigated, they were unable to uncover any suspects at all. So a bit of a background on Cindy James. Cindy was a trained nurse, however she wasn't working as a nurse at the time of this harassment and her death. She was working as an administrator at a children's nursery. She was also recently divorced. She'd been with her husband, Roy, for many years. Um, they actually met when she was a teenager. He was 21 years her senior. Um, and he actually had an ex-wife and kids. So he had a lot of baggage. Um, but they met and they got married and they were together for a long time. Roy himself was a psychiatrist, which is a very interesting point in this case, I think. And they'd been divorced for about four years before this stalking began. The stalking began in October 1982, and when it started, it was just a few anonymous phone calls. Cindy would receive a few phone calls a day, some of them silent, some of them with a person speaking on the other end. Now, I am going to link down below um, a recording of these calls that Cindy received. They are very, very weird, so watch them at your own risk, honestly. It's just very creepy. Sometimes witnesses were there to see the phone calls, including the police. However, nobody actually ever heard the calls in which somebody was speaking on the other end. They only ever heard the silence. As time went on, things advanced. Cindy started to receive threatening notes appearing just on her porch and her phone lines were cut. In just one month, Cindy found three dead cats on her property all with threatening notes attached to them. Cindy, of course, did contact the police and at first they took it very seriously. However, she claimed once she contacted the police, the attacks got worse and the police started to find it harder to believe her with more and more incidents that she was reporting. Still, they were never unable to uncover any suspects whatsoever. A bit of a side note here is that Cindy did become romantically involved with one of the police officers investigating her case. I think he was one of the lead investigators on her stalking case. He was called Pat McBride and they were together for a quite a while, I think they were together for almost a year. They moved in together and everything. It's very weird. He was like the lead investigator on a case that like she was the main like person. Very, very strange. Not sure the legalities around something like that, but hey, that happens. Um, but it is important to note that those two did not know each other until the stalking had already been going on for a couple of months. However, years after Cindy's death, Pat was actually convicted of sexual abuse on a couple of women, but he was cleared of any involvement in Cindy's death. At night, Cindy would hear people walking around her property, her porch lights got smashed, things got very, very weird for her, and if I'd heard people on my property at night, I would also be very creeped out. She genuinely believed that somebody was trying to scare her to death. She didn't think whoever was doing this was out to murder her and to outright kill her. She thought they were trying to scare her into dying. But the police always felt that Cindy was holding back and she never gave them the full details. In January 1983, just a few months after the stalking was first reported to the police, Cindy had her first physical attack. One of Cindy's friends, Agnes Woodcock, came round her house to just visit her, just dropping in, I think, on her way home from work. And when she knocked the door, Cindy didn't answer. She felt the need to go and investigate. 
Um, now, I don't know if she knew about the stalking. I don't think if I popped around a friend's house and announced and they didn't answer, I'd feel the need to go and like find out where they were. I'd assume they were out of the house. However, Agnes went round back of property. I found Cindy kneeling on the ground with a nylon stocking wrapped around her neck. Cindy said she'd been attacked from behind and hit around the head with a rock and all she'd seen from somebody was a pair of white trainers. And after this, of course, Cindy moved to a new house. She changed her surname. She painted her car. She wanted to take herself off the map. And of course this didn't help and the stalking continued. Now at this point, Cindy also hired her own private investigator called Ozzy Caban or Ozzy Cabin. I'm just gonna call him Ozzy. Now Ozzy said the same as the police and after her death, he said that he always felt like Cindy was holding something back. She would never tell him the truth about what was happening. She'd never tell him everything. She'd always be very, very shady about the details of her stalking. Ozzy provided Cindy with a two-way radio so he could always hear what was going on in her house. And one night he was at home and he heard a scuffling on the other end of the radio. So of course he ran around to Cindy's house and knocked on the door, found it locked and Cindy didn't answer. So he looked through the front window and saw Cindy on the floor with a paring knife through her hand. She was rushed to hospital where she said all she could remember was being attacked from behind and having a needle go into her arm. Now, interestingly here is that she was searched over and none of the hospital staff could find any needle marks in any part of her body. Police never found a suspect for this or any of the other physical attacks that Cindy experienced. Cindy said that sometimes it was one person, sometimes he was joined by two or three other people. Um, now, this leads me to believe that police weren't looking for just one person, they looked for multiple. And they never found any fingerprints, any footprints, they never found anything to lead them to anyone at all. Throughout all this, the threatening phone calls were continuing, of course, but the phone calls were always just a little bit too short for the companies to be able to trace. Police would frequently put surveillance on Cindy's house for two or three weeks at a time with up to 14 police officers outside any one time and they never saw anything happen, they never saw anything even slightly suspicious whether Cindy was doing it to herself or somebody was attacking her. They just never saw anything. Cindy's life continued pretty much normally in the time there was police outside her house. So police also set up their own private surveillance that they didn't tell Cindy about. I think they set up cameras in her garage without telling her and again I'm not sure of the legalities around that but hey that's what they did. Um, and so they surveillanced her in private and again they never saw anything whether somebody else or Cindy doing it to herself. December 1985, Cindy disappears and is found shortly after in a ditch six miles away from her home. She's found with a nylon stocking around her neck with her hands and feet hogtied behind her back. She's partially conscious and she's taken to hospital of course where she's drifting in and out of consciousness and she says again she has no recollection of what happened to her. April 1986 and Cindy's reached the point where she doesn't want to be in her house by herself so Agnes Woodcock, the friend who found her when she was first physically attacked and her husband Tom was staying with Cindy in her house. They're woken up by a fire alarm at 3 in the morning and there's a fire that's broken out in Cindy's home. Now of course the phone lines have been cut again so Tom rushes out the front of the house to go to a neighbour to ask them to call the police where he sees a man stood on the pavement just looking at the house. Tom approaches this man to say to him can you call the police and the fire brigade please and the man just runs away and which is very suspicious in itself. What is even more suspicious is that at the time this fire started Cindy wasn't even in her house. It was three in the morning and she'd taken her dog out for a walk. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm being stalked and harassed and I've had like threats on my life multiple times, if I've been drugged and tied up and thrown in the ditch, I would not be leaving my house at three in the morning to go and walk the dog alone. I just, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. The police assessed that the fire had started in the basement and from whereabouts in the basement the fire had started, there was only one sort of entrance to get into it from outside the house and that was a window however the window pane was completely untouched there was no fingerprints on it and all the dust was undisturbed so although this was the only place that the attacker could have got in to start this fire the window wasn't touched at all which leads me to believe that the fire was started from like inside the house or somebody inside the house after this incident cindy's doctor believed she was becoming suicidal so committed her to a psychiatric ward she was in there for 10 weeks which I don't know really about mental health care and stuff in Canada, especially in the 80s, but over here, like in the UK, to be in a psychiatric ward for 10 weeks, that is a long time, and that is when your like, healthcare professionals believe that you're really a danger to either yourself or to others. So for Cindy to be in there for 10 weeks, that's two and a half months, 
I believe that people thought she was pretty severely mentally ill. Of course, you can't find out her medical records, that's all confidential. You don't really know what happened inside this facility, but I think it can be assumed that Cindy was pretty ill at this point. Now, a psychiatric who was caring for Cindy in this time said that he believed that Cindy didn't have anything like mentally wrong with her, she didn't have any multiple personality disorders. He believed that she was genuinely terrified for her life. After her release from hospital, Cindy starts to accuse her ex-husband, Roy Makepeace, of being her tormentor. Um, and it's some pretty serious allegations, some pretty serious like abuse he received from her. Cindy kept a journal, and I'm not going to like read out the journal stuff, I'm going to get a link it down below, so if you want to go read that you can. But she was pretty bitter towards her ex-husband and what had happened. Her ex-husband, like I mentioned earlier, was a psychiatrist and he believed himself that she had a multiple personality disorder and that she was very mentally unstable and that was one of the reasons why they divorced. Shortly after all of this, Roy received his own anonymous phone call and on the end was a very raspy, strange voice that pretty much said, Cindy, dead meat, soon. The police believe that Cindy left this message itself. The voice was very similar to the voice in all of the other phone calls that Cindy received, and it was just very strange. October 26th, 1988, Cindy is found hogtied with a nylon stocking around her neck in the back of her car, again with claims that she can't remember anything of what happened. And things culminate on May 25th, 1989, where Cindy disappears from a mall parking lot. Her abandoned car was found shortly after with blood found on the driver's side door and her wallet scattered underneath the car. Two weeks later, on the 8th of June 1989, her partially decomposed body was found in the back garden of the abandoned house that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Now this is where things are a little bit weird. A lot of teenagers held parties in this abandoned house and there were parties between May 25th and the 8th of June and nobody ever reported Cindy's body being seen there. The coroner's report actually said that Cindy hadn't been dead for many days when she was found. Although she was partially decomposed, it wasn't two weeks worth of decomposition. So Cindy's actions are completely unaccounted for in about a week after her disappearance. The body was found with cuts and bruises on it, and again in the whole type position with a nylon stocking around her neck. Her actual cause of death was a drug overdose, not the very tight nylon stocking. She was found to have over 10 times the lethal amount of morphine and fluorazepam in her system. The police believed, of course, that Cindy had staged her own disappearance and had committed suicide, whether intentionally or not. It is believed that Cindy ingested these drugs via tablet form, not injection form. If that much morphine was injected into her, she would have been out straight away. There is no way she would have been conscious with that amount in her. However, if it was ingested in tablet form, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to act, and this is how the police believe it was ingested, and that would give her plenty of time to hog tie herself and tie a stocking around her neck. And yes, experts have determined that it is totally possible to hog tie yourself if you know what you're doing. In this, I think there are two very strong sides. There is the side that says Cindy was definitely stalked, she was murdered, and there's a side that said Cindy did this all to herself. Um, I am going to talk you through some of these theories and let you know what I personally think. Now, of course, the first theory is that Cindy was stalked. And of course, this stalker would have had to have been crazy, crazy smart to be able to pull this off. He was never caught, there were never any fingerprints, never any footprints, there was never anything at all that pointed to this being done by a human being, ever. In over a hundred incidents reported at the murder scene, can you imagine how like many forensics would have been done at the murder scene and nothing whatsoever was found? So if this was a stalker, he was very smart. And to me, like this is literally just like my own little theory if she was stalked, I think it must have been somebody who knew what they were doing. It had to have been somebody Dexter style, maybe somebody who worked within the police department, knew what the police would look for, knew how to cover their tracks. And I think that's very interesting. I think whoever did it would have been crazy smart and would have had a lot of knowledge about how police work. If it was a stalker, the fact that they were never found on surveillance doesn't really say much to be honest because like I said, they would have had to be crazy smart. They would have known when Cindy was being surveilled and they would have just steered clear in this time. And of course, as soon as the surveillance leaves, she would be attacked again because they would have known that the surveillance had gone. Her family, of course, are 100% convinced that she was telling the truth this entire time. 
and that she was murdered which I know doesn't really like count for much but that is what the family think so I feel like it's important to say here. Psychiatrists said that her terror seemed 100% real, her doctor didn't commit her to the psychiatric ward for anything other than her suicidalness, is that a word? Probably not. He just thought she was a danger to herself so put her in the ward. And of course the police were present during some calls along with Cindy being there. So if Cindy was doing it herself, either she had an accomplice or she was very smart and knew how to trick these phone lines. There are only really three suspects in this case. I use suspects very lightly because the police don't consider them to be suspects. But if you are going to be looking at people, you're going to be looking at her ex-husband, Roy Makepeace. Or you're going to be looking at Pat McBride, the police officer that she became romantically involved with. Or you're going to be looking at the man who stood outside the house the night of the fire. Now I've got a little bit of information about her husband Roy and I don't know how true this was at all. I just read this in a couple of sources but I couldn't find anything to like back up these sources and to be honest I think it's pretty unbelievable but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, shortly before their divorce Cindy and Roy went on a husband to an island, I can't remember what it was, we got a G, damn it Georgia. Apparently on this holiday, I think it was written in her journal, Cindy witnessed Roy and a friend kill somebody and cut up and dispose of a dead body. Now I think this would be pretty good grounds for divorce um, but like I said Cindy could have potentially been very mentally ill when she wrote this and reported this. There isn't really anything to back this up at all but if Roy was the person who did this to her I think that's a bit of interesting information that I wanted to share but I really don't know how true that is. The second and third theories I have to mention here are very closely linked so I'm going to sort of like intertwine them. It is possible that Cindy was harassed to begin with, um, maybe she did receive these threatening phone calls and she contacted the police and maybe she liked the attention she got from the police. She's recently divorced, maybe she was just very lonely and so when the police started to sort of like lose interest in these phone calls she was receiving, maybe she just continued it herself um, just to receive the attention that she was craving. Maybe it completely spiralled out of control when they really stopped paying attention. That's when she started to stage these kidnappings on herself. Or maybe it was a form of Munchausen syndrome. This is a very, very interesting illness. It's a mental illness where people deliberately and repeatedly act as if they were ill, like whether physically or mentally, to garner attention from other people. And um, of course, Cindy wasn't pretending she was ill. She was pretending, pretending I should say, to be stalked and harassed but I suppose it all comes under the same umbrella. Something that's very important to note with Munchausen syndrome, there is a state of awareness. Cindy would have known what she was doing, she wasn't like past that point where she wouldn't have known what was going on anymore, she would have known and she would have been doing it because she wanted that attention. And the fourth theory that I have is that Cindy did this to herself. Now bear in mind that I've been looking at this case in depth for many many days now, I believe that Cindy did this to herself. But I don't believe she was aware she was doing it to herself, I think Cindy was very mentally ill. There's this illness called Dissociative Identity Disorder, you might know it as Multiple Personality Disorder. The illness itself is very widely disputed by sort of medical professionals, some people will say it's definitely real, some people say it's totally made up. But let's for the sake of this say there is a real illness and I personally believe that it is, I've known of people that have had this. Um, and I very much believe that it's a real thing. If you've seen the film Split, I have very, very mixed opinions on that film. I don't think it's the best representation. That is what dissociative identity disorder is. It is multiple personalities and most of the time you're totally unaware of the other personalities. And this illness would explain a lot of what happened to Cindy. It would explain the blackouts where she can't remember anything. It would explain why the police never found anything and why they were so convinced it was Cindy doing it to herself. And it would also explain why Cindy was always so terrified. Either she was an amazing, amazing actress or she was genuinely unaware that she was doing this to herself. Now, DID is usually caused by a serious trauma, either when you're a child or sort of older in life. Um, it's basically your brain's way of protecting itself. It sort of compartmentalises parts of your personality and it just sort of creates other personalities. It's so smart. Your brain is the most incredible thing in the world and I believe that it is capable of doing something like that. Now, I am i don't know what sort of trauma Cindy would have been through as a child or later in her life. Maybe if Cindy had seen her ex-husband chopping up some dead bodies, that could be trauma that would lead to something like this, I'm just saying. Maybe the psychiatrist caring for Cindy did believe that there was something there, 
because again she was in a mental hospital for 10 weeks. Her ex-husband believed himself that she had multiple personalities and who would know her better than somebody who lived with her for nearing 20 years I think it was. Um, I personally believe very much that this is what happened to her. I don't think she was ever aware of what she was doing to herself. I don't think when she died she meant to kill herself. I think she was meant to be found just kidnapped. Um, but I think she overdosed accidentally and died. The Canadian police spent around $1.5 million researching into what was happening to Cindy. And $1.5 million was spent and they never found anything, meaning either the police were crazy, crazy useless, or there was genuinely nothing there that they could find. So this is a very interesting case and it's a very controversial one. So please let me know what you think happened to her. I personally believe she did have multiple personalities and although she wasn't aware of what she was doing, I do think she staged it all herself. But of course everyone has their own opinion so let me know what you think happened to her. There are obviously so many theories, theories I haven't even mentioned here so just let me know, type away. Again as always if you have any mysteries that you want to see in this series please let me know down below or just tweet me, my twitter is at georgiamariexo, please come follow me over there, chat to me, we can be friends. Um, and thank you so much for watching. Bye. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to me.